see exactly how he has laid out his message in the stars, which we looked at last week. All of this is to point to God. <clears throat> it's not to point to the individual things that comprise the signs that he has given us. Last session, we looked at light being, or excuse me, night being divided by day. And that was the fourth major division in creation. The first light in day one that God provided was himself, the Shekinah glory, because the stars hadn't been created yet. Now, one of the reasons that the scripture says in Genesis for making the stars was to be a sign. And a sign signifies something. A stop sign tells us in traffic that we have to stop. A red light tells us we have to stop. So these are fundamental signs that point to something that, that we are required to do or at least understand. The sign itself is not the destination. It's just a way to get us to pay attention to the direction that sign wants us to move in. Well, that's what we saw last week in the stars. As we go through the review this week of last week, I'm going to condense this, but we're going to still see the message that's in the stars that has come out from what God has given us. Now, the entire creation is what theologians refer to as general revelation. In other words, God has revealed himself through the earth, the trees, the plants, the animals, everything we see comes from God. This is one of the arguments for the existence of God. You look around you and you didn't create your environment. You didn't create your body. You didn't create your neighbors, your friends. We are here by the grace of God. We are not here based upon our own creative power. God created this earth, this general revelation, and everything speaks to him. God's trying to tell us something by this creation that he wants us to pay attention to him. He wants a relationship with him. He wants us to be tightly knit to him in a relation with him. The only way we do that is by understanding the Bible, by studying the Bible, which is where God speaks to us. He speaks very specifically there. This is general revelation looking out. Specific revelation is the Lord Jesus and how the Bible speaks to us. Psalm 19 verses 1 to 6 says that the heavens declare his creative output. And it's not the heavens that God wants us to pay attention to. It's the signs that the heavens have provided us that he wants us to pay attention to. Now we looked at this somewhat around Christmas time when we were looking at the stars that the Magi followed. And we looked at it again last week in greater detail. God's handiwork is displayed in the stars. His majestic creation points to an even more majestic creator. It is the creator that we are to focus in on. And I'm going to say that a lot this morning because it is not the stars or the creation that he wants us to focus in on. It's him. He wants a relationship with us and the revelation that he's provided us all points to him. His glory reaches all nations. It's intelligible to everybody. It's like a universal language. Everybody can look up at the heavens, especially on a clear night. If you've never done that, if you've never gone down to the beach here in Pentwater and looked up on a clear night, you should do it. It's just magnificent. The volume of the stars that are in the sky are just astounding. And God says in scripture that he created them. He gave each one of them a name. They are all identified, every one of them. And there's billions of them out there. And we saw last time that the stars in the heaven move around a circular path. It's called the elliptic. And there's a band on either side of the center of that elliptic. 
and uh, we call it today the Zodiac, which is a corruption of the original Hebrew Matzeroth. And so the names of these stars, like, uh, or the, uh, excuse me, the constellations like Virgo, Pisces, Capricorn, and so on, they're familiar to us uh, as they come out of the uh, occultic horoscope, but the stars themselves have been used for centuries by ancient mariners to guide them around the seas. Now, Satan has corrupted them for his occultic purposes, and we get the zodiac and we get uh, the occultic uh, practices of horoscopes coming out of that. And that's a long way from the original truth. A long, long way. When we get to Genesis chapter 11, we're going to see how this corruption took place. Uh, the Tower of Babel, along with a worldwide communication disruption that happened to stop the volume of sin, or at least slow it down, that was taking place there. And when we get there, we're going to see that what people were doing were getting intimately involved with God's design of things. We're going to look a little bit at his design today, but that's what we'll see when we get to Genesis 11, the corruption of God's design. The 12 zodiac don't have anything to say about man at all. They have, as the uh, horoscope folks will tell us, you know, you can predict your future and your health and your wealth and this stuff. Well, it's not true, but they do have a lot to say about the redemption of mankind as God presented it. Uh, when we get to uh, Genesis 49 and we see how Jacob is allotting the blessings to his 12 sons, and two of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, will see how he has given the name to Judah as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And um, that is one of the constellations, Leo the lion, so is Virgo, the virgin birth, that we have real accurate information on still for the sign that the decans or the sub-stars give us within those constellations. Remember, God wants us to know him. And through these stars, he's given us, at least the ancients that knew these well, the plan for redemption. You know, the Bible speaks uh, very little of creation. There's a few verses in Genesis, I should say a few chapters, a little bit in the prophets, uh, a little bit in the gospels, hardly anything. A little bit in the epistles. But there is an enormous amount about the redemption. Most of the Bible is about the redemption of this earth and the people that live in it. God's plan of redemption is announced in these stars. He's not in the stars he created the stars. He just wants us to see how powerful he is and how he has provided for us and wants those relationships with us. He controls, he creates, and he strengthens these millions and millions of stars that are out there. And as I said earlier, he's amazingly named every one of them. And he makes it real clear that he does not want us to worship the stars. He does not want us to worship the creation. It's an abomination. It's an entrance into the occult. And he does not want us to do that. He's made that really clear in Isaiah 47 and Deuteronomy 4 and 17. And uh, other passages. I've just put a few of them down there in your notes. He's made it really, really clear. These things... To worship these stars and get involved in the horoscopes is an entrance into the occult. You don't want to go there. So those names have meaning. All the Hebrew names have meaning. And when we get to the fifth chapter, we're going to see how the plan of redemption is laid out in the genealogy of the people, of the patriarchs, if you will, starting with Adam through Seth and all the way to uh, Noah. But God has demonstrated his sovereign control and a message that he wants us to see. And it's been obscured. 
And there's really no need for that message today because we have, we have Christ that's here that provided the redemption. But long, long ago, before Christ came, this message was very, very apparent. It's the Hebrew Matzeroth. We see this in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the world. It was written at a time when the patriarchs were written about in Genesis. So it would be around 2350 BC, the book of Job was written. Now the book of Genesis, which discusses the patriarchs, wasn't written until 1445 BC after the Exodus. So Moses wrote those books but they were dictated by God on Mount Sinai when he gave Moses also the blueprints for the tabernacle and an understanding of the covenant that he made with him, that conditional Mosaic covenant. If they would do certain things, then he would bless them. And they didn't do that. They didn't follow God. They didn't do what he wanted. So he took blessings away from them. But what we have to understand here is this zodiac is perverse. God does not want us to do that. The ancient Jews in the Mosaic time got involved in this stuff. They got involved in the occult when they went into Canaan. God told them not to do that. They did it anyway. You know, and we're also not supposed to be afraid of the stars. So there's balance here. He wants us to understand what they are, understand the message, and the fact that they're a sign and they point to something, but not get involved in the stars. So there's balance in everything in God's economy. Everything that he wants us to do has balance to it. Now we saw last week, and I put a couple of... Um, pictures in your notes last week where we saw a picture of Virgo, which I didn't put those in this week. We saw a picture of Virgo and we saw the stars that are in the constellation of Virgo. The Virgo, the star, and then it's decan. So there's 12 stars in there. And those are not in your notes this week because I didn't want to take up space with something that I've already given you. Now, People have linked those stars together, sort of a connect the dots type thing, and said, okay, this picture represents the Virgin, this Virgo, or Leo, this represents a lion, or Gemini, the twins, or something. And I've tried over and over again to see the picture, and it's not there. I mean, you have to be really fanciful in your imagination to see a, vir a Virgin in that constellation. I, I just don't see it. And uh, until I started studying what some very conservative biblical scholars had written about this, did I start understanding what they were. The stars all have particular names, and every Hebrew word has meaning. So the name, he, in Hebrew, for example, my name is Daniel, Daniel in Hebrew. It means judged by God or a, a judge of God. I am judged by God. Uh, Adam means mankind. Seth means appointed. They all have meaning. I mean, you can buy dictionaries with, that the Hebrews have written, the Jews have written on what all the, what the names are. So you want to name your kid something, uh, and it's a Hebrew name, you know what that meaning is, to assign him a name, and hopefully his personality will match up with that. It's surprising how that, that happens, too, how it works out that way. But the names have meaning, and it forms a message. So it's not the outline of that constellation. It's the statement of the order of the stars in their brightness to dimness that produces a message. So that the signs of the zodiac with their deacons in the order of their brightness produce a message. Now what's happened to these over centuries and centuries, I would say millennia in the last 4,000 years, we've lost a lot of the Hebrew names. So the folks that did the research on this, Dr. Seiss and Dr. Bullinger and others, what they've done is they've gone to the other cultures to see where their myths, if you will, and their discussions of these things have produced names. And they plug some of those names in there to replace the Hebrew names. It's not 
um, complete, it's not real accurate, but relative to Virgo and Leo, we have the accurate data from the Hebrew words. And I'm going to read just two of those before we look at today's um, lesson. Virgo the Virgin, if you look at those stars and their names and their deacons that I put in your notes last week, the message says, the seed of the woman, the desire of nations, the man of double nature and humiliation, the exalted shepherd and harvester. It speaks to Jesus coming, the seed of the woman through the virgin. And we're going to look at the seed of the woman and the dual nature of that verse in Genesis 3 when we get there in a couple of weeks. Women do not have seeds. Women have eggs. Men have seeds. So it speaks to the virgin birth, and we'll look at that in much more detail. I'm not going to read these others that I've put into your notes here, but I am going to look at Leo. And the message there says, The king rending, the serpent fleeing, the bowl of wrath upon him, his carcass devoured. And all of these move through the entire Bible redemption account to ultimately show the victory, the final victory over sin where Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. So it's important to know that these signs in the heaven are to speak to Christ, to speak to redemption, to get us to focus on God, not the specific signs. And what we read last week was that God now speaks through Jesus of Nazareth in these last times. Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 3. So we don't need those kinds of detail in those, the Matzeroth, to realize what the redemption of mankind is because it's in Jesus of Nazareth. In these last times, as the book of Hebrews says, we have the complete information the theologians will say that the biblical canon is complete. And canon is just a word that means measuring stick or standard. And it means that our Bible is complete. It tells the whole story. And we have to come close to it. And we have to stay in it to understand how God speaks to us. Because that's how God speaks to us. We pray we have devotions, we do Bible studies, but it's our personal time in that scripture that God will speak to you. He will speak to you through his spirit, the Holy Spirit, and he will illuminate that scripture. He will teach you all things as Christ promised. And he will fill your heart with gladness by that relationship with him. And he'll make everything else less important. So for today, we're in Genesis creation, day 5. And the text for today is Genesis 1, verses 20 to 23. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moveth, wherewith the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Uh, I'm using the American Standard Version of 1901 today. Genesis 1, verse 20, has the Hebrew word, Vayomer Elohim means, and God said. It is very common in the Bible. Vayomer Elohim. Vayomer Elohim. It's a Hebrew expression, and God said. And it's throughout the scriptures. As God has spoken to the ancient Israelites, and us too, through this Old Testament. It is in the early chapters of Genesis ten times. I should even say the early verses of Genesis 1 and 2, 10 times, Vayomer Elohim, and God said. The early theologians, the Jewish folks, the rabbis that were in medieval times saw a pattern here and began to think that 
the rakia, the space, the firmament, the Bible says, has more dimensions than just the four that we see. We see length, width, and height, the spatial dimensions, and we see time, which is a physical property. Einstein proved that. We see these four dimensions. The rabbi said, we think there's ten, based upon the way God said Vayomer Elohim ten times. Now you can look at that as fanciful. Nachmanides, a Spanish rabbi in the 13th century, came up with this the first time. But particle physicists, including Einstein, knew that there's more dimensions here than just the ones we see. They knew that there's more. They just can't get a handle on them. When we leave these bodies at death, or if the Lord comes for us first, we're going to see real life. This is not real life. This is temporary. We're just here for a short while. And we know that Christ referred to going to the other side as entering life. You go there and you stay there. We're only here for a short period of time. It's important for us to understand that this is not all that there is. It doesn't end here. It starts here, but it doesn't end here for us. Now, God's creation in this Vayomer Elohim statement, he's marking the fifth day of creation as something's going to happen. And God said, he always uses that in the Old Testament to precede some creative output of his creative will. And remember, he's got two general categories of his will. His creative will and his permissive will. He causes things to happen and he allows things to happen. For example, sin came into the world because he allowed our first parents, Adam and Eve, to sin. He could have made us robots, but he didn't. He made us with an individual will to love him or not, to want a relationship with him or not. He didn't make us programmed robots that we were forced to love him. That's not love. And that never works. You can't force somebody to love you. You know that. Well, God made us so that we would see what he's done and want to love him. That's what he wants from us. He wants that relationship more than anything. God spoke and the creation came into existence. And we saw that in Genesis 1.1. Barashit bara. Elohim va'et hashemaim va'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God, the first and the last, created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created. We're on day five now, and these are 24-hour days. The Hebrew word for day is yom, and it always refers to a 24-hour period. When we get to day seven and God resting, we're going to talk about the Sabbath and we're going to talk about the factual information available from the scientific community about the 24-hour day, the seven-day week, and the 365 and a quarter day year and where that comes from. God caused on this day sea and bird life to come into existence. And this is the first time he uses the word for soul. The Hebrew word is nephesh. Nephesh, it's the word for soul. He's saying here that these creatures have some degree of intelligence. He's not saying that they have the souls that we have. He's using this term in these early verses in Genesis to demonstrate that now there is a creation component that has some activity in it. Not like a plant or a tree that we've seen in the previous days. This has some activity, some consciousness, if you will. And he goes in to then talk about these great sea monsters. Great sea monsters. He specifically 
brings those out as an individual portion of the creation of the sea life. Tananim, Tananim. And it's found four times in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and the Psalms, and Ezekiel. They get special attention here. We're not 100% sure why they're getting special attention, but it's important to realize that when the pagans in Canaan worshipped the whales and the other big things in, in, uh, in the sea, they also made up something they called dragons. And they said that these were, in their rebellion from God, in their myths, they were worshiping these things. And the ancient Hebrew, or excuse me, the ancient Canaanites called the sea monster Lotan. And Lotan is just a mythological character that is part of the Canaanites pulling away from God. The Jews were supposed to go into Canaan under Joshua. They were supposed to completely cleanse the whole land, get rid of all the Canaanites, or convert those that they could. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. When we get to Joshua, we'll look at what those circumstances were and why that happened. But God set this large sea monster apart. And what we think it is, is because he wanted the Jews to know where these things came from. They did not come from the myths of the Canaanites. And if we stay close to God's word, like he wanted the Jews to stay close to his word, you realize these things, and you're not going to believe the myths that come out of the popular culture and the local civilizations. God set his holy people apart, his Jews, and he has set us apart. Apostle Peter calls us a royal priesthood, that we are set apart from the rest of the culture. It doesn't mean we're better than the rest of the culture. It means that we've been redeemed and we know that the culture will try and drag us down and God does not want us to go there. God does not want us to go there. He knew that the Jews, when going into those pagan cultures, were going to get drawn in by their superstitions and he did not want them to do that. By staying close to God's word, you know truth, and as Christ said, it sets you free. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. By knowing the truth, you see the myths that are out there, and we're commanded not to believe that stuff. Believe God's word. Believe God's word. We are going to be tempted on a regular, daily basis. It happens. But God has told us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that he will provide an opportunity to pull us away from the temptation. Same thing with Hebrews 3, 8. The temptations are common. They're everywhere. But he gives us opportunities to pull us away from those temptations. Staying close to God, staying in his word, fills you with truth, fills you with his word, fills you with what he wants us to do, and allows us to quickly see the path away from the temptation when it comes in. There was a man, um, William Paley, and he was a, a British Christian guy. He was an apologist and a philosopher, a apologist simply means somebody that is a defender of something. So a Christian apologist is a guy that defends the faith. I remember early on in seminary, I saw that the first time, and I thought, an apologist? My goodness, and I'm thinking of the common usage of the term. I'm thinking, why is somebody apologizing for Christ? Well, that's not what it means at all. <laughs> but I didn't realize that at the time. <clears throat> it means in defense of. Now, Paley was a proponent of what philosophy calls the teleological argument for God. I don't get into philosophy very much because I think it is a vain, empty, no-ending pursuit. 
uh, philosophical arguments don't go anywhere. They just go in a circle because there's never a, re a resolution. God's word is revealed truth. It is the end of the arguments within Christianity. It does not produce the beginning. But that being said, in the secular arena, there is this philosophical line of argument called teleological arguments. And Paley was one of the um, proponents of this. And uh, he simply said, and this is really a simple statement, a watch has design, therefore it has a designer. Makes perfect sense. <clears throat> but uh, at the time he was doing this, people were starting to think about evolution. Darwin had not written his Origin of the Species Treatise yet. That was until the late 1800s, but this was about 100 years before then. He was just basically saying, Paley that is, hey look, look at a watch. Somebody designed the watch. You know, it, uh, springs didn't crawl out of some primordial soup and, you know, they didn't just fall together here. Um, this has a design. Therefore, there's a designer. And that, very simple. <clears throat> and he was saying, look at the world. There is a design here in this world. Therefore, there must be a designer. You know, you can take this to the absolute absurd and say, if a tornado went going through a junkyard, an old junkyard, would a brand new Cadillac come out the other end? I doubt it. You know, and that's an absurd argument. And, uh, you know, you can say that and say, well, that's crazy, Dan. Why are you even saying that? Because when we look at day seven and I bring out what the evolutionists maintain has happened as opposed to what creation says, it's a little less clear because the evolutionists are very, very creative in the way that they put these things together. The fundamental argument is uh, there is a design, there has to be a designer. My house didn't come together by chance. My car didn't come together by chance. My watch didn't come together by chance. My computer didn't come together by chance. It's absurd to think that these bodies came together by chance. We didn't make these bodies. We don't even make our children. We follow God's plan for making our children. We have sexual intercourse with our spouse. We produce children we didn't create them. We are living the creation that God made for us and we are producing what he wants us to do. It is his creation. Anyway, some of the earliest guys that brought out this teleological argument for God were Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, uh, Marcus Felix. <clears throat> they were all early tele tele telegists. <laughs> Excuse me. When we get into our next session, I'm going to talk to you about entropy and thermodynamics. Um, I'll make it as simple as I can. I don't want to go into great detail about it, but there's a couple of fundamental laws that you learn in engineering about thermodynamics that give us a picture of what's going on out there. The engineer has to understand these things if you're going to build something that's going to keep going. Because if you don't understand the forces that are trying to hold you back, from putting your engineering systems in place, you're never going to build something that's going to work. You know, you're going to build a car that's not going to go anywhere, or a generator that won't do anything. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. What I want to look at today, though, was in keeping with the design of the watch, I want to look at an atom, the basic building block of all matter. And it is a very basic building block. But an atom is a unit that has components. An atom has a nucleus. And that nucleus has a cloud, if you will. We refer to this cloud as negatively charged electrons that move around the nucleus. And the more you look at the atom, the more amazing it becomes. We didn't make the atom. We're only discovering what the atom is. <clears throat> the electrons are bound.
bound to the nucleus by an electromagnetic force. So the electrons in this cloud that move around the nucleus are bound in a particular pattern of movement by that electromagnetic force. And a group of atoms can remain bound to each other and those are called molecules. You get a bunch of atoms together and you get molecules. The name atoms comes from a Greek word, atomos, and from uh, tomo, to cut. Means, it means actually uncuttable or indivisible when that word was first given. Something that can't be divided any further. And the particles within the atom we call subatomic particles. The nucleus, for example, we call that a structure that can't be broken. Well, that, had, that was true until the late 19th century, late 1800s, early 1900s, when the physicist figured out how to break the atom. And we know uh, the net result of that is by breaking that atom, we know that there's been atomic bombs, massive unleashing of energy. They discovered that you can divide the atom by doing certain things to, to it. And those things ultimately break that cloud of electrons that are around it, which then go all over the place. They bombard the nucleus, and the nucleus gets separated and it comes apart. Once the nucleus comes apart, and its protons and neutrons are broken out of that nucleus, and look at that picture I put in there. Once that breaks, it touches the atom next to it, and it breaks that one apart. Because now you've broken one, and you've got the power being unleashed from creation to take the orbital path of those electrons out of its orbit and it unleashes an unbelievable amount of power. I don't know if any of you have read of the accounts of the bombs that were dropped in 1945 in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, <clears throat> but those were small compared to what's today. And those blighted huge geographic regions. People burned and it smoked to death in an instant. There were just nothing left of them. And the people that were on the perimeter of the blast that received the radiation, their skin was falling off of their arms like it was a sleeve or a coat that was coming off. I mean, these blasts were greater than any of us have ever experienced or can imagine. It's what happens when you break God's design. God does not want his design of this earth to be broken. And we see this happening all the time. Not atomic explosions, if you will, but we see his design being broken. We see his bodies that he's created for us being misused. We see the homo rise of the homosexual community saying they can do this, that this is their right. Well, it, it do whatever you want, but you know, when you go against God's creative design, there are repercussions. He has designed a physical nature. He's designed a moral structure for this universe. When you break out of those, you're outside of God's will, and negative responses are going to happen. When that basic building block, the atom, gets broken apart, the energy is so great it can't be measured. There is no way to measure it. People have a rough idea what they think the measurements are, but they can't measure it. It's huge, absolutely huge. And I'm a firm believer that we're going to, well, we won't see this. If you're a believer in Jesus, if you really love him and believe him and follow him, just like the Bible says, you won't be here for this big war that's coming, the Great Tribulation. And we see this throughout the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 6 and going all the way to the return of Christ in 19. 
we see this enormous amount of disruption of this planet to make an end of the sin that's here. It's the broken will of God creates these issues. They're repercussions. It's a reaction. It's a chain reaction. So the nuclei come apart and cause massive amounts of energy to be distributed. <clears throat> the size of an atom is so small that we can, we, we, it, it, it's, it's almost, it is imperceptible, it is so small. And the differential relationship between the size of that nucleus and the electron cloud that orbits it is like 10,000 to 1. You know, for, so let's, let's, well, it's, it's even, uh, the nucleus is 100,000, excuse me, 100,000 times smaller than the electron cloud. And it's the difference between a, the pinhead, a pinhead, compared to 100 meters. 100 yards, just think of 100 yards of football field compared to a pinhead. That's the difference in size between the electron mass around the nucleus and the nucleus itself. Remember, they're bound together. Um, the molecules that form as a result of the atoms binding together, um, they come together and they form things like hydrogen or nitrogen or oxygen, and then those bound together again and they form complex amino acids. So these are like building blocks that God has provided here. The tiniest of cells of living organisms are made up of a hundred billion atoms. I can't even imagine a billion of something, let alone a hundred billion of something. And they're far more complicated than any machine built by any human being. Way, way, way more complex than we can imagine. They have no parallel in the non-living world. None whatsoever. In other words, nothing compares to the design and the complexity of a cell. And I want to talk about a cell just for a few minutes before we close today. A simple cell. Remember that term from biology? <laughs> the simple cell. My goodness. <clears throat> the simple cell is like a factory. Have any of you ever been to the Ford Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan? Oh, if you haven't, you ought to see it. it it's an absolutely incredible place. Um, <clears throat> it encompasses an enormous geographic region, and in the uh, beginning of the products going in there are raw glass that is being made, raw iron ore that had just been pulled out of the mines, Coming in on one end to a steel mill and a glass plant, out the other end comes a car. Henry Ford, the first Henry Ford, wanted a plant that would do everything. He didn't want to rely on anybody. He even used the boxes that the things that he had to buy came in. You know, he had to buy some raw materials, and the boxes that those came in, he even used that to build his cars, he used it to the floorboards of his cars. But that factory, as complex as it is, and you can go through there in tours, it's really fascinating, pales in comparison to the cell of living organisms on the planet. That picture that I put up there shows the plasma membrane which controls what goes in and out of the cell. Um, the mitochondrion is like the power plant, the energy source. Um, the chromosome in the DNA is in the nucleus. That's what tells the cell how to reproduce and what to do. Those are the instructions. These are like robotic machines but hundreds of thousands of different types. Um, they have what computer folks would call an artificial language. It's not artificial in the sense of artificial as we would say it, but artificial language means it has its own language that it understands and communicates with itself to instruct itself to do something. It's a language that was created by God to do something. We call this the deoxyribonucleic acid, the DNA. 
It has memory banks for information storage. That's the nucleus. It's got a control system that regulates the automated assembly of the components in the cell. There's a prefabrication and a modular design, and there's an air-safe way to proofread these devices and quality control them. It's just phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. And to believe that this came about by chance is ludicrous. <laughs> it just can't happen. It's happened nowhere else on earth. No factory has ever come together. The Ford Rouge plant came together by a lot of careful planning, investment, design, and work. You know, and to believe that you can get a brand new Cadillac or whatever car you like, let's say I like Audi, so a brand new Audi, out of the junkyard when a tornado goes through is ludicrous too. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. The cell is unequal to any factory in the world. It's capable of replicating its entire system in a matter of hours. I've never seen any machine in any of the factories I've ever visited that can make another machine itself. You know, I've thought about maybe putting my car next to another Audi and hopefully we'll get a small Audi. I don't think it's going to happen. It can happen. But just think about this. Think about our bodies and the life on this planet as machines that reproduce themselves. Makes more. Makes more. Nothing else can do this. I, I, I don't want to go deeply involved in this, but uh, when we look at Adam and we look at his creation in the sixth day and then we get into a little more detail, we're going to see that when a seed from a male impregnates an egg from a female, that process starts something called mitosis. The, the cell divides. You start with one egg, and pretty soon you got two components, then you got four, and then you got eight, and then you got 16, and so on. And the DNA in those cells instructs each cell of what characteristics it will have, which part of the body it goes to, how it's going to function, what it's going to look like. You're going to be a blue eye, you're going to be the retina, you're going to be the iris, you're going to, and, and it tells them what they're going to do. That's the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. We don't fully understand what that is. But I'll tell you this, the double helix, and I got a picture of that on the last page of your notes, is similar to two strands of fishing line. If you took these two strands of fishing line, and they were each 125 miles long, you wrapped it all up and you stored it in a volleyball in an organized manner, it's unzipped in there. It's not tied up in an unorganized way. It's copied and it's restored on spools, if you will, at a speed which is about three times that of an airplane, an airplane propeller. That's all within a cell giving it instructions. And the smallest part of the cell, it's in the nucleus. The double helix, it's constantly moving, but it's extremely well organized. That's the smallest part of creation, the simple cell. <laughs> My biology teacher used to tell me in high school, I said, okay. But it doesn't even begin to accommodate the nephesh, the life, the soul that is within us. Who are we? Where does that activity come from? It's in living, breathing beings. It comes from God. We're made in the image of God, and we are infinitely more complex than the complexity of the creation that we've demonstrated this morning. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you.